Since I recorded the first part of this talk, there's been a lot of activity in the media. First, there was the ridiculous uh, British politician who said that natural disasters were to be blamed on the legalisation here of gay marriage. Then there was the impassioned speech, uh, the brilliant speech, by the Irish celebrity Panty Bliss. And finally, of course, uh, there was always the furore around the Sochi games and the discovery that President Putin has gay friends and likes the music of Elton John. So, this subject seems relevant. Too many bigots appeal to the Bible, to scripture, to defend their impossible views. I'm afraid my suspicion is that these same bigots don't even read the Bible for anything else. It, it can be a proof text to defend the most obnoxious and um, short-sighted positions. The Bible has been used erroneously, um, for example, to defend slavery, the abuse of women, uh, genocide, anti-Semitism. Well, there's a great deal, sadly, that can be said about that. And crusades. These people who appeal to the Bible to promote homophobia are in very peculiar company. I hope this series of talks will make these people, these bigots, pause before they invoke texts that they do not fully understand to justify their continued and appalling views. In the first part of this talk, we looked at the three Old Testament texts in their historical context and in the way that modern Judaism interprets them. We noted the link between homosexuality and pagan religious cults, and also um, unattractive forms of warfare, a form of torture, an Abu Ghraib type of um, activity. So successful was the campaign of the Jewish writers to eradicate these abuses from their society that what we have left are some curious texts that can today be misunderstood. We must think of them like a jeweller who takes a precious diamond from one ring and places it in another. It's still the same precious stone, but its original context has been lost, and these texts similarly have been isolated by history. To add more metaphors, they are the orphans abandoned by successful parents. We need now to be cautious and kind when we come to dealing with them. When we come to the New Testament, we again find aspects of the debate that are linked to paganism. We've got three quotations again. Uh, Romans 1, verses 26 to 27. Now here, what Paul is looking at is a condemnation of something which is unnatural. But he uses the word natural or unnatural in other contexts. He uses it, for example, in 1 Corinthians about hair length, which presumably is something that we don't take that seriously today. Christians found themselves in an environment where they were uh, challenged by mystery cults and by the exploitation of slaves. This is not our world, and the admonitions must again be seen and qualified by a cultural context that has passed. Modern scholarship has gone much further, and in looking at Romans 1, 26-27, we can approach this in four different ways. We can follow the bigots and say that this verse or these verses clearly condemn homosexuality as unnatural. But these verses were not universally interpreted in this way through history. The early fathers of the church are focused on cultic emasculation, not homosexuality. Even as late as Erasmus in the 16th century. And we must never forget the anathemas at the beginning of Lent in Orthodoxy that still damn Origen, who took Matthew 19.12 too literally and castrated himself. What seems so obvious today to the bigot was not so obvious to someone 1,500 years ago. Why do the early church fathers not take full advantage of these verses in Romans? And we know that some of them, for example, St. John Chrysostom, were elsewhere quite deeply homophobic. If they don't use these verses for that purpose, then maybe that's not how they were intended to be used. There's nothing new about 
homophobia. So why this change? I think this first approach must be mistaken. Let's call it the traditional approach. Let's get back to my four approaches to the Roman text. We've had the traditional or fundamental approach which is marred by inconsistent interpretation and indeed by issues about the authority of the actual text that we use. Let's recap. What seems like universal condemnation of gay behaviour is actually a modern post-Reformation view that is not supported wholly by the early church fathers. So it's not traditional. Now, secondly, we should look at the context of these verses. We can say, well, mm, Paul is actually giving us a history lesson. Paul is telling us about what was in the past. So we can't automatically draw conclusions about what is in the past and bring them into the present, because he's talking about this great change that happens with the advent of Christianity. Christ eradicates the law and re-establishes union with God uh, through the atonement or through the, the lovely idea of theosis. Now, theosis says that with the fall, man and God are separated. With the incarnation, Christ shows us the way of reunion with God. Uh, to quote St. Athanasius, God became man, that man may become divine. Since God and sin cannot coexist, to paraphrase Aquinas, when God became man's sinful, fallen human nature is transformed. Everything Christ touched becomes, in some way, godly again. Creation is renewed. So we have a new opportunity to connect to the divine through the incarnation of Christ. Our actions as human beings are transformed by God's love. God's love is most perfectly expressed in the Trinity, a series of reciprocal relations. And we aspire in our human relationship to such reciprocity. Of course, there can be selfishness, prostitution, but in a proper loving relationship, surely either straight or gay, we are participating in the transfigured life and our nature itself is transformed. In the next section, my third approach to Romans 1, 26 to 27, I shall look at the idea of nature itself, what it means. And then in the fourth section, I will look at a revolutionary approach to these verses. And finally, I will look at other Pauline verses against homosexuality and consider more positive images in the New Testament.